So this is the first uh, meeting online and uh, the, the idea is coming from the friend I'm staying with here in, in Tenerife in, in the Canaries, Canary Highlands. And we don't, uh, our idea is to do this from time to time, those uh, meetings online. And uh, at first, the, for you to understand the, the genesis of all this, at first, uh, there is a, a whole student of mine living here who is supposed to organize a, a training in the Canaries Island. And she's the one who, who was thinking about planning a program. But unfortunately, she is sick since the last uh, four days and I haven't seen her. And so the idea was to have a face-to-face -face lecture, but as she is uh, unable to attend, she's in, in her bed. Uh, so we thought organizing also this online lecture. And uh, as, you've, as you have seen, the topic is written in a strange way. It's just yoga with interrogative point, question point, question mark, which means uh, the, the way it was planned was that uh, people would put question and we would have a kind of conversation instead of only a question and answer. That is, as you, many of you, you already know because you are in yoga in a way or another, that uh, since the last 30 years now, there is a whole amount of books that came out about yoga, giving explanations and exercises. And this way of looking at it has brought uh, according to the tradition has brought a lot of confusion. So the main idea for those talks is trying to, in one way, to clear up the meanings and on, on the other way, to question together uh, as uh, today, there are many, many questions. It's, it's quite strange. I am I am part of the European Yoga Union, which gathers about uh, 20, 26,000 yoga teachers all over Europe. And I'm part of the board. And just last year, we once again had this question. Uh, how do we define yoga? What is it? Which is strange after five or six millennia to still put the same question. And Maybe it has to be redefined according to our today world, today way of, of living, or our today understanding. And this is, uh, that was the topic of this meeting. And if there are some others, it will be the same topic. So, it will mainly be about a conversation between you and me, which means uh, I really need you to, to come into the conversation, not, has, uh, not through speaking, because it's, uh, this Zoom system is not so easy to manage when people are talking online, but uh, you can put your points of view, your question in the in the chatting box, and uh, I will take I will take these points of view, and from there we will go on. We have planned about one and a half hour, might be longer, you know. So for a start, I want to give you uh, a few directions of investigation into this word, uh, which, as you know, is, uh, I call it an exotic 
word comes from another um, culture, Sanskrit. And uh, sorry, can you can you be aware? to keep all your mic closed. I'm going to close them, but be aware because if you open them, it'd be very noisy. So, uh, so this, this word, yog, when we go through, uh, there is one, very deep dictionary called the Monier Williams. It's not the, the only one, but it's, it's, it's the one that it, it's used in the universities. Um, we don't find the word yoga, it doesn't exist in Sanskrit. <laughs> we find the word yog, Y-O-G. And it is explained with three different meanings. It seems to come from a period where people were plowing the land. And you know, this instrument that is bringing the two oxes together, uh, in English, we call it a yoke, Y-O-K-E. Uh, and that's the first meaning of, of, uh, of yoke, this instrument that keeps two oxes together. And when we are talking about the meaning of yoga, there is two ways of going into that question. One is historical, and one is, let's call it intuitive. Now, regarding history, nobody really knows when what we today call yoga uh, appeared. No one knows. Precisely. So once again, one of the first meaning is this instrument that comes on the necks of oxes for plowing. And beyond this instrument, this definition, there is also a symbolic meaning. That is, uh, I don't know if you ever done this <laughs> today, uh, it's quite rare. I saw there is somebody from India who was connected. And we, we still see that in India. Uh, farmers who are plowing. And with these two oxes, there's always, always one of them who is leading the movement. And the other one is following. But they have to go together. That is, there is a leading process and then uh, a leading process and then the following process. And this, we will find it again, uh, once again, this is symbolic. That is, within human being, there is a side that is leading and another side that is following. And I'll go into this later on. The second uh, meaning I'm talking about dictionaries of the second meaning of yoga is found in astrology. It is what is called a conjunction in astrology. That is when two tendencies are going together in the same direction. Uh, they are different when you do this uh, astrological chart according to the position of each sign. Uh, some of the position are going together, some others are opposed, some others are in contradiction. So yoga in astrology means conjunction, that is two tendencies that are going together. Then there is a third domain where this word yoga is found, uh, it is, let's call it in spirituality. And in spirituality, it has the meaning of 
it has once again two meanings. The first is state of union, state of unity. And uh, the other meaning is the ways for being united. And that brings again, sometimes a confusion in between, we could call it the goal and the mean, and the way. Now, according to, there are some quite important texts that, that are using this word yoga. And one of them you might have known is called Bhagavad Gita. Uh, the Gita is talking about three means, three ways. One is called action, and then one is devotion, and the third is knowledge, uh, which this gives the three different ways for investigating into that state of unity. Yeah? So once again, action, devotion, and knowledge. What it means by action means activity, movement, doing, something that we do, let's say, with the body. Uh, but it, it means everything that is done. The second devotion has to do with different level of what we today call love. And the third knowledge is, is self-study. That is discovering or exploring the different qualities of the mind. And these are the three different ways that are given since nobody knows exactly when Gita was written. We don't know. It, it comes from a much bigger book called the, the story of India, uh, which is a good translation, and Mahabharat, Mahabharata, they say. Huh? So it's quite interesting because Maha means big, Bharata is the name of India in Sanskrit, but Bharat also means man, and Bharat also means the universe. So this huge text called Mahabharat is like a story explaining the whole life. And right in the middle of this text, which is very big, it's a big, big, big thing, you know, 15 or 16 big volumes. Right in the middle, there is the Bhagavad Gita, which gives yoga has three different ways, action, devotion, and knowledge. Now, when we come to this understanding of both the goal, let's call it the goal for now, so the state of unity, and then the meaning, the mean, the, the way, which means uh, the the, the possible behavior to maintain, to keep, for going into that state of unity. And unfortunately, this word yoga has both meaning, the goal and, and the mean. And sometimes we mix them together. So once again, a state of unity on one side, and on the other side, the ways for going to that state of unity. It means also uh, joining together, that is joining what we, call, what we could call personal and non-personal being. So personal being means the feeling that we have that for sure we exist, we are alive. And then the non-personal meaning is what we believe. We believe of something 
which is not me or you or which is not ours but which is something different which is not from you from me from anyone and from there two ideas came that this non-personal being was somewhere outside and probably the religion have been built on this idea that there is somewhere something or somebody outside that is uh, kind of running life. And the other point of view is that this non-personal being is included into the body matter. The the yoga itself being the way for joining those two together. So in India, they gave two different words, two different names to this. Personal, they call it Atma, and non-personal, they call it Brahma, Brahman, sorry. Now, when we come to practical things, Very often we, hand, we think that by either doing action or developing a knowledge or a state of love that through these three, we are going to reach that link. And many, many times this idea is, it, it is very spread today. None of the teaching are talking about this. Teaching are always talking, by, mean, by teaching I mean on one side the few texts that we have and also the teachers. Uh, so they are talking about what we call a sadhana, so in French, in English, sorry, we say practice. And this practice reduces the obstacle for realizing that state of unity. But they don't help in any way to reach it. It's only about reducing the obstacles. The sadhana, the practice, is about joining the fragment, for example, the fragmented mind or the opposition into different inner states or feelings or activity when there is no harmony. And this is very common to mankind, this tendency to be scattered, to be fragmented. So the, the main point is to reduce this fragmentation and not to reach something. And through reducing this fragmentation, and this is a question, we shouldn't take all this for granted. Uh, by reducing the fragmentation, the perception of unity might appear. Today, uh, we have, unfortunately, so much reduced yoga to, I don't know, nobody understands why we have come to such a shallow point of view, which is sometimes almost stupid. That is twisting the body or you know, putting the body in different positions. It's very strange that it has come to that point. Traditionally, there are 17, one seven definitions of these words. And I'm going to give you some of them. And from there, we could start the conversation.
there is no definition about physical activity. It doesn't exist. And I will, I will, I will tell you uh, uh, 12 of them, 12 of those 70. The, uh, the five others are very, very subtle and complicated to the question. So the very first one that is commonly found is that that state of unity appears or flourish when the thought is totally silent and quiet. So now remember that we will no more use the word yoga, we'll use the word state of unity, which has much more meaning for us than this exotic word. Uh, a second definition is uh, to be skilled in our actions. That is, to be skilled in action brings to that state of unity, to be precise in our action, actions. Another definition is uh, when we renounce the consequence of what we do, that when we are not looking for, traditionally it is said, when we are not looking for the fruits of our actions, then the state of unity occurs. Another has to do with to give oneself completely. Uh, in fact, it is said that to sacrifice our life. And sacrifice has to be understood as a sacred fire, not into the ordinary Catholic meaning where you have to sacrifice. That is to, to have this sacred fire and with it, to give your life to others. Passion. Another definition is that that might sound strange. Uh, to go out of the cycle of birth and death. So that might sound strange for us because in our belief, uh, when we die, it's over. And there's nothing. But the cycle of birth and death has to be understood. The cycle of when you feel something is begins in your life. And when you feel something stops in your life, ends in your life. For example, the beginning of the day or the end of the day, beginning of a love story or the end of the love story, beginning of a work uh, when you're out of job. So it is about psychologically going out of this process of beginning and ending. That is, when the mind is no more into this, then the state of unity is perceived, is lived. Another definition is about um, keeping our place in society. That is uh, discovering our personal duty, our personal task. What do we have to do in this life. And once again, when this becomes clear, when I discover what is my position in life, then the state of unity occurs. Another definition is, uh, to get rid of the mind constructions. 
to yeah to end we could say today the conditioning i i tell you again all these sentences are definitions of this word state of unity or yoga uh, another is definition is focusing on non-relativity, focusing on the absolute. That is not staying with things that are changing, which means everything is changing. <laughs> so it is focusing on what is not changing. Another definition is uh, to get rid of the feeling of the me, what sometimes we say the, the ego, or the sense of mine, what is mine, to get rid of this. And here again, when this tendency of losing the sense of me or mine is gone, that state of unity occurs, appears. Another definition is linking together uh, perception and, and action. Sometimes we say consciousness and energy. Consci consciousness has to be understood as perception, sensitivity. And energy is action, movement, activity. So when there is no more conflict or fragmentation in between perception and action, that state of unity occurs. And the last definition, uh, maybe 12 out of 17, is has to do with contemplation. Contemplation, we, most of the time we say contemplation of what is. Contemplation of uh, reality as it is. Sometimes this contemplation is also understood or translated as meditation. Not meditation as an exercise where you think about something or you focus on whatever object, but that state of perceiving without interpretation, without going into the movie of, of the movement of life, this contemplation. Now, uh, Sorry, okay. So after all this thing, which might appear unusual for some of you, uh, these are all not answers, but all of them are question marks of what could be the way for moving towards a state of unity. What do you want us, in which way do you want us to go now? Now the, the, uh, the word is yours. Oh. It says, but what kind of meditation, mantras or postures can help me enter the state of unity. <clears throat> what kind of meditation, mantras, or postures can help me enter the state of unity? This is strange. <laughs> After all this presentation of these 12 different um, possible understandings, 
to have such a question. What kind of meditation, mantra, or posture can help me enter the state of unity? So first of all, we have to understand that meditation is not a way to enter into anything. Meditation is not a practical thing. Meditation is a state. And for that state to happen, we have all these choices that have listed with 12 different definitions. Uh, as we can, I, we can say that the state of unity is the meditative state. It is the same for us. Meditation is not a practice. It's a state. It's a state where, if you remember, the thought is completely quiet or silent. It is a state where we are skilled in action. It's a state where we no more hope for consequences of what we're doing. It's a state where there is no movement. Now, the question is not what kind of meditation can help me enter. The question is, is that state of meditation possible? And how much are we ready to go into this? Which, if you remember, includes sacrifice, includes renunciation, includes quiet mind, includes going out of the cycle of beginning and endings, includes to be free from the sense of me and mine. Are you interested in, in going into this? And not looking for kind of kick that will boost you into God knows why, if God knows something. <clears throat> Same thing when you're asking about what kind of mantras of posture so this is much easier. Posture is not this funny thing that people are doing on a piece of carpet. That the word asana, the very meaning of word asana in Sanskrit means a pillow. And the second meaning is to be seated, which doesn't mean to put your, your bottom on the, on the chair. It means to be seated inside. Now, a much larger meaning of asana is the relationship that we have to body matter. What kind of relationship do we have with body matter? This is much more important. Today we have a lot of knowledge about body matter. Uh, we all know today that being a man or woman, we have the same cells. And uh, deeper than the cells, if we're talking about matter, uh, there are much finer parts of matter. But let's stay with the cells. There is none of the self, cells that define what you call me. This doesn't exist. Cells are coming from memory, from the genes. Today, we know quite a few things about this. 
genes are coming from your parents, then grandparents, then grand grandparents, then grand 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 grand. That is, the body matter is composed of tiny cells, and each in each cells there is the memory of all mankind. So when we are talking about the relationship to body matter, we don't mean at all to take some steady position on a carpet. This is very, uh, I mean, this, this definition, this understanding of yoga is very, very new. And uh, uh, I don't say it has nothing to do with body positions. I'm saying it's much more deeper than this. It is the relationship that we have with our body. So, taking this in account, what kind of position do you have to keep for coming closer to the state of unity? And when you put the position, the question this way, I hope you have an answer by yourself. How to position my body to be, to feel more united. And not theoretically, but practically, really doing it. How do you sit? How do you walk? How do you sleep? How do you wash the dishes? How, how do you put your body when you dress up, when you, or when you leave your clothes? It's mainly about that. And what kind of position do you have to maintain physically so that you feel less fragmented? And not one hour from time to time when, when staying on the carpet, but in daily life. How do we, how, how do we live with our body? We all know that uh, since 30 or 40 years ago, kind of fashion has spread all over the world, mainly because of betrayers. Uh, most of them were, Hind were uh, Indian asana teachers who insisted so much on doing funny things with the body on carpets. And it brought this confusion. I'm not saying that all this is bad. I'm saying that asana means being seated inside also and for feeling seated inside it has to do with how do you put your body in which position how do you take care of this body that has been given to you is it possible to to be the servant of the body matter. Is it a possible state to be felt in, inside and also a possible, a real behavior to be the servant of body matter and not the controller? which is the new fashion in what people have called yoga and carpets. Not being a controller, but being the servant of body matter, which is the memory of all mankind. It's really another meaning of asana, of postures, which is much, much deeper than those funny positions and carpets. And it's okay, you have to position your body anyway.
And the third part was what kind of mantra or popo can help me enter the state of unity. So here again, uh, as human beings, we are composed of many three things. Mainly there are others, the body, the speech, speaking, and thought, thinking. Mantra, the word mantra, uh, the, the root man comes from, for those who know a little bit of Sanskrit, come from the, the word manas, which is the mind. And tra as a suffix means to protect. So mantra means to protect the mind. And we understand that the, the, the highest protection of the mind is to give him, to give it holidays, to give him rest, to put it in silent, to make it quiet. The way for quietening the mind when we use the speech, mantra, remember, is also a formula is being very, 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 very clear with whatever we say. That is, everything that we say should be crystal clear, should not have any kind of confusion, should be perfectly clean. Having that kind of relationship to speech helps the mind to become quiet, much, much quieter, at least. So the relationship to body matter, understanding it as, I am the servant of the memory of mankind that has built up this body matter. This is a very, very clean and clear and crystal clear position and second is, whatever I say should be perfectly clear. That is, what I say should signify what I think without any fragmentation. This is a way for entering that state of meditation that you were asking about, to be clear, clear-minded, clear talker, and servant of, of body matter, which is once again, memory of all mankind. In fact, it's much deeper memory than mankind, because we also compose finer than the cells. We also compose with particles. And we today know that all the particles that have been discovered anywhere in the universe, we have the same components. So we are not only the result of all mankind, we are the result of all the, all the universe. And this is the body matter. So to be the servant of this beauty and to keep the body fit so that it doesn't bring troubles and we can, we can stay with that sensitivity and we can develop it. Because once you're sick, the sickness is taking all the space. Hmm. Another question is, you said 
going out of circle of birth and death, is it not being affected by these states or by fears? Our body is going to die. Can you precise? I read it again. You said going out of circle of birth and death. Is it not being affected by these states or by fears? Our body is going to die. Can you precise? So, once again, to go out of the cycle of birth and death, uh, either you have a belief, the belief being that when you die, you will come back again, you will be taking birth again. It goes with the same belief that before taking birth, you were dead. This is an idea. This is a theoret theoretical point of view. There are many, many in Hinduism, there are many, many explanations about this death and rebirth, what is called reincarnation. For many of us, we, we have understood that we die and then we take birth again, and we die and take birth again, and we die and take birth again. Uh, it is just only one point of view. There are many, many others, uh, not many, many, there are about five, five or six others, different ways of understanding it. But what we mean in, in yoga is not this. It is when we feel that when, when we feel that something is beginning in our life. And when we feel that something is ending in our life. Let's take an example. Something very important for many people is when, as we say, when they, they, they fall in love with somebody else. So, when you fall in love with somebody else, immediately there are fears that comes up. Most of the time they come from your past. And there are also projection. You project a future. It's the beginning of something, and we cannot face this beginning. We make project very quickly, or we fear that it might turn bad. Can, is it possible to stop this? That is, not planning, when there is a beginning, not planning a future. We all know that we will die. But what we know about death is when other people die. Now, the one who know about death is the one who are still alive. We have no idea of what's going on when somebody dies. We don't know. Death exists for people who are not dead. And it is just an idea. And we have built up theories about it. Now, what is meant by going out of the circle of death and birth or birth and death is ending the time. Ending the time. I'm not talking about practical time. 
at least it's about one uh, 55 minutes that we are together. I'm not talking about that time. I'm talking about psychological time. The idea of aging. This is what is included into this definition of unity when going out of the process of birth and death. Is it possible to live a life where there is no psychological time, where there is no project, and where there is no hmm, reminds reminders where there is where there are no regrets that is where the psychological time is over this is what is meant by going out of the cycle of birth and death because in the same way that a huge percentage of people is not able to remember his birth in the same way the huge percentage of people is not able to face his death. We don't know what these are. And we today know that birth is a momentum. There have been quite many months before. And the question is, when did you start? as a being. And the question could be even deeper. Did you ever start as a being? And we could also ask, did you ever end something in your life? Psychologically, did you ever end something? That means, no remembrance, psychological remembrance of the past. Did you ever end something? This is what it is about. Ending of psychological time. It is not about these theoretical points of view about I don't know why we say taking birth <laughs> and giving birth. It is not about taking or giving. It is about what is time? And this definition of yoga is that the state of unity is or occurs when when we are out of time, when there is no more time. Theoretically, many people have written about this, making a difference between past, present, and future. What is present? When, when is present? When is it? Is there a particular momentum of present? Because from this momentum, what was before is the definition of the past. What will come after is the definition of future. Is this an idea or is it a reality? What is immediacy? What is it? What is immediacy? The nature of time. What is the nature of time? And this is what these definitions are about. They say the nature of time is unity. That is. <laughs> A sensation where there is no more fragmentation, no more 
differentiation. No more in and out, no more me and you. Nothing that can be defined in time or in space or in identity. This is what it means by going out of the circle of birth and death. And this has a real meaning for us, not theoretical meaning. Theories are just points of view. And we are able to, in, to create so many. But there is this possibility of immediacy. In that immediacy, there is completeness, fullness. There is no more fragmentation. The moment time comes back in our psyche, then there is fragmentation again. I was that, and I, I, I would love to be, to, to be as I was, <laughs> for I would like to be this in the future. This is fragmentation. And we can easily understand that it is very childish to hope being as we thought, as we think we were before. And it's also very childish to think that we will be different in the future. This is, there is no maturity to this. And what was said before that to have a clear mind is a part of this. We should no more allow ourselves to be immature. Never. Not even for joking. Because it, it keeps a certain pattern in the mind. And when this pattern goes on and on and on and on, it becomes a conditioning and it works without our will. It works by itself. And we're kind of a slave of the thought, of the beliefs, of the ideas, of the ideals, of the theories. And we don't realize that we are slave of ourselves. It's a very big chance to realize it because we suddenly realize that there is no master. And uh, we opens up the possibility to be a, a disciple of the natural movement of life. <laughs> In the case of a difficult choice, how can the state of yoga help to make a decision? In the case of a difficult choice, how can the state of yoga help make a decision? I'm going to be a little sharp. <laughs> This is not a question. When that state of unity occurs, this question doesn't exist. This question exists only in, in the fragmented mind. Because 
in such a state when it occurs, even if it doesn't last for long. First of all, there is no question. Question have disappeared. And so there are no answers, of course. But I don't want to sound too miraculous, but in that state, whole situations find the order by themselves. You don't have to make a decision. You don't have to do something. That, that, that state, it, I, once again, I don't want to sound miraculous, but when this state is there, it brings order by itself. It is just like a, a child, you know, child sometimes, children, I mean, children sometimes, they wish to do something very, very, very simple for the adult mind. But the child asks, the child asks, he said, can I go in the kitchen, for example? And the answer is just obvious. You don't have to think about it. But for the child, it is a question. And there is a state of mind where when the father or the mother hears such a question for the child, remember what it brings inside. It brings a sensation of happiness because it's very naive. And there is no question, in fact, there is no problem. So it looks a little bit like that in those extraordinary moment, momentum when there is that feeling of unity, you never have to make any decision. Unity produces order. And it might sound ununderstandable, and uh, yes, it is. It's ununderstandable. It, it, it has to do with a quality of simplicity that is beyond understanding. It seems that the silence prior to unity is not necessarily silence without words. That it is deeper and cannot exist even with words or noise. It seems that the silence prior to unity is not necessarily silence without words. That it is deeper and cannot exist even with words or noise. I suppose can exist. Hmm. Uh, We make a difference into, well, let's, let's make it simple for the moment, in between two types of silences. One type is this gap in between two sounds or two noises or two words or two 
notes of music. That was a silence in between two words. That kind of silence has to be listened. That is, when you yourself speak, put, reduce the speed of your speech and bring some silences in between words or sentences. You will then give the possibility to the listener to really listen to you. If you have a very important flow of sound, flow of noise, you cannot listen anymore. It's very difficult. Uh, we are here in Canaries, which means uh, Spain. And for Sunday lunch, we had a meal nearby. And there were quite many people. So, and Spanish people, they speak loud. And also there was music, permanent music. So there is no silence, never. And it's difficult to listen. Of course, you have to really make an effort for listening to somebody who speaks or speaks to you or the neighbors who are talking. So in those way of using the speech where you leave some gap of silences, it helps a lot for others to listen, but also it helps you a lot to listen to your own silence. To be aware of the gap in between noises. I call them intermediary silences. Now, in Tudor's Intermediary silences. The silence is of the same nature of the silence of the universe. For, for listening to somebody or listening to yourself, you need silence. Now, there is another type of silence, which is, if we go back to body matter, for example, the silence of the cells, the silence of the tree that grows, the silence of the clouds, the silence of nature. This silence has nothing to do with words or intermediary silences. Intermediary silences, they come and go, they never last. There is another kind of silence that is the basis of all, all, of all sounds, of all activities. By listening to the in-between words, in the silence in between words, by listening to this silence, it is of the same nature as the fundamental silence. Is it possible, is, is it possible to 
to listen. Not for understanding. Remember, all understanding is coming from the past and the conditioning. Not listening for understanding. Listening just for listening, without any object. What is the state of listening? The state of listening is itself the fundamental silence. Can, can you catch this? Can you follow this? And the, the, the only fact of listening without object, without, without motive, without desire, without project, without memory, the only fact of listening is silence. And it is a silence that has no beginning. It doesn't have any source. It is not the cause of anything. The silence, which is a cause, is always an in-between silence, in-between sounds. You know, when you are in a place where there is a lot of noise or sounds, when you go out of this place, there is silence. That is the consequence. It is not this one that I'm talking about. It is the very state of listening is that fundamental silence. It is not to be looked at anywhere in the universe. It is only about that state of listening, a listening without any motive, any project, any regret, uh, a quality of listening where there is no time. And in this quality, they can be sounds, they can be people who speak, they can be birds singing, they can, what, it has nothing to do with it at all. It is the quality of listening. So the quality of listening is silence. Is it possible to get rid of your psychological mind in a way that you can still function in your daily life? The memories, the traumas are very strong. And in some kind, they are a part of what I call I. Is it possible to get rid of your psychological mind in a way that you can still function in your daily life. The memories, the traumas are very strong. And in some, some kind, they are a part of what I call I. <laughs> what do we mean by I? Is I built, is, is the INS the psychological mind? So is it possible to get rid of the psychological mind in a way that you can still function in your daily life? Is it possible to stop to function in your daily life?
That is, is it possible psychologically to live a life where your past doesn't interfere and where your hopes for future do not interfere? Is it possible to, to have a daily life that is not functioning, but that is creative? It is not so much about getting rid of the whole content of the psychological mind because the psychological mind is not yours. It is the mind of the mind of all mankind. Do, do you get this? Do you, can, can, do you follow this? We don't have a personal psychological mind. It's very little, very, very little. Psychological mind is the mind of all mankind. That is, that is mainly built up with sufferings. Because what makes us happy is not really stored in the memory. What is stored is all the sufferings, all the traumas, as you said. What makes us happy is never stored. Happiness has to do with immediacy. Of course, we can remember that uh, six years ago, I was somewhere with uh, somebody who loved me and you know, blah, 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 all this. And suddenly I'm alone in my kitchen and oh, I have, a remembrance and I feel happy for a few seconds. But this is a fake life. I'm just sitting in, 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 in my kitchen and I'm, I'm, I'm building a movie. So we could compare the psychological mind as a movie. You know, today you can, you can store in your internet an enormous, an enormous amount of movies. We are, this has been built up by, by the mind because we are doing the same. There is a, a difference is that we change our memory. We, we cover it, we make it different. It's very interesting when you have gone through an experience with a friend and a few months after you talk with that same friend and you say, you remember this and that and that? And your friend is going to say, yes, but it was not exactly like that. We don't have exactly the same memory. Now, through those experiences that we have stored within us, we have built, conditioned activities. We have built conditioned patterns. Sometimes those patterns become so strong that any kind of new situation that would occur, we will answer from those old past patterns. Means we never face the present. So how do we have to position ourselves inside for stopping this?
Don't ask for a recipe. Uh, look, 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 look in yourself. How do you have to position in worldly? How do you have to in worldly position yourself for stopping answering to a new situation from past conditionings? It requires to be completely open to the unknown. It requires to be very clear-minded for not being overtaken by our past. It also requires to have a very strong motivation for a complete life, not a second-hand life. Second-hand means the past. How strong is, your motiv is our motivation for completely living anything that happens? We cannot know. Nobody can know what future will bring. It's impossible. We just have to be clear-minded to understand that the future is now. You, you understand this? Future is now because now is the consequence of the past. Consequence of the past is now. So now is the future of the past. And it is also the past of the future. Now, is there an inner position to keep for facing the now? Once again, it requires a lot of opening to be open to the unknown, to we don't know what's going to happen. A clear mind that is No confusion in between what I would have loved to live or what I would love to live in the future. No, con no confusion about what is. There's no choice. That's it. Ah, that's it. There is no choice. A, a state where there is no choice, where you don't have to choose because you're facing the now. So, yes, the past has built up a fake persona that is somebody, or let's call it an energy. I don't want to shock you too much, but uh, the past has built up a fake Person, fake person, past is over. Traumas, memories, all this is past. And if we cling to them, which means if we cling now to them, if we cling to them, then yes, there is no way out. If we are in that state of mind where you do not allow the past to step in, in that moment, you are free. The thing is, to stay so alert that second by second, you stay free.
And once again, this requires a lot of opening to the unknown, a very, very clear mind for not being overtaken by what we think the I is, what we think I am. Let us, very, let, let us be very clear. We have no idea of who we are. We don't know. We are a mystery to, our, to ourselves. We don't know. Can we stay with the mystery? Because this is a reality. We don't know who we are. And the question is not, have we known before or will we know it later? The question is, right now, we have no idea who this I, I-ness is. We don't know. And of course, there is this process of storing informations and experiences and ideas and theories and beliefs. Can we look at, at this reality? Is this memory, is this memory really helping us in the now? We have acquired technical skills. This is okay. We have learned how to, whatever, cook food, how to build a house, uh, how to drive our car. All this is not a problem. The problem is what we have stored has sufferings and conditionings and psychological patterns. And all this, they don't help us at all. In fact, sometimes they stop us even for driving our car or building a house or cooking our food. They, they, they never help. So is, is, is there an inner position where we stop playing with this? We could have a kind of stick in our hand and whenever we, we realize we are stuck in the past, <laughs> to bang our hand. Then, you know, we, we, need, we need to be shocked for these kind of things. I'm not talking about violence. I'm talking about something which is shocking, suddenly. And the moment we realize we are into the old psychological pattern, stop it. Even if you are in the middle of a word or an action, stop it. And as, as it was said before, did you, did you ever stop something? Or is there still always something, you know, going on and on and on and on. Once again, it requires a clear mind, an understanding, an opening to the unknown. Maybe it also requires a kind of love, kind of affection. I'm not saying a love towards something or somebody, I'm not saying a love towards oneself also, but this quality of affection, 
where you stop hurting yourself out of affection. We, we don't deserve suffering. But psychologically, many of us, we think we do. Especially in this crazy conditioning world of religion, which is totally crazy. It's a very, very big stupidity that we have invented. Two, we don't deserve suffering. Nobody. And this is what I mean by affection. I'm not talking about uh, romantic or sentimental love for something or somebody. This is not what I'm talking about. It's a quality of affection where whenever I see that I am into a process that is linked to my psychological past, I stop it. There is no magical trick. We are very, very responsible and there is no other way. And responsibility means ability to respond. We are able to respond to our way of life. We have this ability. <laughs> Somebody said, what about inspiration? What about breathing? Just breathe. <laughs> Don't worry about this. <laughs> you know, uh, some, some type of exercises in in what we have defined uh, globally as yoga, have developed different ways of breathing. It is called pranayam. Pranayam has many, many meanings. Uh, I mean, for, for defining this word, I think a little book would be enough. There's so many meanings about this word. And one of them is it has nothing to do with you. Absolutely nothing. Through this whole movement of mankind memory, a body was built that came out of a lady, a woman, a mother. And when this amount of memory came out, it faced oxygen and it started breathing. That person has done absolutely nothing at all. Nature is doing it. It doesn't require your acceptance or your refusal. It works. And breathing stops. We have witnessed that sometimes some people, they stop breathing. We say they have expired, which means they are dead. In between these two moments, you have nothing to do. It works. If you are alive, it is not because of you. 
there is a natural process that we call life and we are included into it that we don't decide our thought as doesn't have the capacity to decide we are we are alive not through personal will and into this movement that we call life there are many tiny movements going on digestion thinking breathing of course and you don't choose whatever you eat you will digest it it is not about you decide or you don't decide and breathing is the same Now, we have witnessed that we can stop eating for quite a long time, several days, and what we call life goes on. We can stop speaking and what we call life goes on. We can stop sleeping. So the length, the duration of all this stopping are different. Regarding breathing, if it stops more than, let's say, three minutes, what we call life is over. So, many, many ways that have been called yoga have insisted upon becoming very sensitive to the breathing, the natural breathing to listen to it, to feel it, to sense it, to be very close to it. When we do that, we realize that into the breathing, there are different steps that are coming back again and again and again and again. So, inhalation, exhalation, and of course, tiny moment, of suspensions. And what has been perceived by so many people is that through perceiving very quietly, very deeply, very attentively the movement of breathing, into this quality of awareness. Nobody knows why, but sometimes into the process of perceiving the breathing, suddenly there is no more fragmentation. We feel being the whole life itself. We feel being no more somebody who is breathing, but we feel being somebody who is breathed. And we don't know the origin of the breather. We don't know the origin of the breath. We don't know the origin of the breathing. We just witness that suddenly all fragmentation have gone. And then sometimes, sometimes into that very strange state, we have something that we call an inspiration, which has the perfume, the flavor of revelation, something totally new, something that doesn't belong to history. And on the other side, there are all those technical ways of controlling the breathing. Many type of yogas are interested in controlling the breathing. One of the very big question that is avoided into this controlling of the breathing is who is the controller?
what is it that wants to control? And simultaneously, there is the another kind of question, which is, who is the watcher of the breathing? The answers to those questions are not, cannot be given through words. The answer to these questions are a state where the question disappears. There is still another question, then we will stop. I'm not sure to understand it. How did yoga develop these roots and the quest of unity? How did yoga develop these roots and the quest of unity? I don't think yoga ever developed something. Once again, remember, this, this word means the state of unity. So the question comes, how did the state of unity develop these roots and the quest of unity? So it's a strange question. Because that state of unity is itself the root of the whole movement of life. And maybe on this planet, maybe, maybe, we are the only species that has forgotten. Maybe. That has forgotten, forgotten the taste, not the quest, but the taste of unity. Maybe whole plants, whole animals, whole minerals, Enjoy it, maybe, don't know. But we are sure that we don't enjoy it anymore. If we have ever enjoyed it, I don't know. Now, this is a, a funny question, which means, is the state of unity looking after itself? And that's a huge question. <laughs> I don't want to go into this. But uh, I remember in, in Christianity, there was this almost a fight that said, man is looking for God. And then the other point of view was, God is looking for man. And it was quite strong. Uh, almost a fight for years and years and years and years. And uh, an outcome came from an Indian traditional point of view, which says, only God is looking for God. Only unity is looking for unity. And what we have to realize is that we are the playground of this question. And that's a big, big point. I don't want to go into this tonight. Uh, we've been together almost two hours now, that's enough. And uh, so I suggest you to, to have nightmares about this question. <laughs> not to sleep about it. Until you have the answer, you don't sleep. <laughs> you know, there is something that 
our understanding cannot grasp, cannot grasp. When we come to that point, the only thing, the only position that we can stand is say, okay, yes, this is beyond my understanding, I cannot. And to be quiet with this, to be like a servant facing something so wide and deep and large that you inwardly kind of bow in face of it and say, yes, I am. And stay with that. Accepting that the mystery of life is beyond our capacity of understanding. And bowing in front of this beauty to be completely like a servant who is happy because his master is happy <laughs> and end here. Maybe we see again if another meeting is organized. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Ah. Merci. Thank you, Andrei. Yeah. Have a good time in Spain. Spain or? Portugal. Portugal. I always mix up. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Merci, Andrei. Merci. Merci, Andrei. Merci à tous. Merci.